welcome, welcome. Tonight we have another special guest on the home stretch with Agent Durant. We are welcoming Priscilla Frederick Loomis. Mrs. Loomis. What's going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And Thank for you. those who are just joining us on the home stretch, we love to talk to amazing people, amazing athletes, specifically track and field athletes. And we want to hear about their journeys, their trial, tribulations, and successes. We want to hear about their lives and what they're doing, and really about what it takes to be a champion, what it takes to be successful so we can apply these principles to our own lives. So um, let's get started. You're a high jumper representing Antigua and Barbuda. Yes. And let me run down your resume really quickly. Uh, it's quick, so boom, bam, <laughs> boom, bam. Oh, come on now. 2014 CAC Games, silver medalist. 2014 Pan Am Games, runner up as well. In 2015, you were the runner-up in the NACAC games. Runner-up, runner-up, what's that all about? It's the same girl, too. It's the same <laughs> girl, Laverne. Laverne Spencer from St. Lucia. Yes, keep runner-up. Yeah, second place. You're rival. <laughs> you're still mean, rival. Laverne, yeah, you're, you're um, pleasant rival. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Pleasant rival. Yeah. Of she's, course. She's wonderful. Yeah. Shout out, shout out. <laughs> but it's also good you guys grew up, you know, through the ranks together. For real. We've been, she's been in the game longer than I have. She's been in the game for forever. I feel like I met her back in like 2002 or 2001, back around the CAC Juniors or something. Way back, way back. In the game. Right? Like, that's crazy. Yeah. That's 20 years ago. Yeah, stop it. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me finish. 2015. Competed in the world championships, very impressive. And 2016, the big one in Rio. I definitely saw you out there. And um, in 2019, Pan Am runner up. Yes. Oh, to the man. Person. <laughs> okay, well, this is this this rivalry. We gotta get us gotta get the W here. <laughs> I think I beat her like once, but it wasn't even like for first, it was like for sixth at like a big meet. And I was like, oh man, nobody's gonna wow. remember. <laughs> okay. So, although you represented Antigua, you came up in Queens, Queens, New York. Queens. Shout out to my New Yorkers. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, how'd you get started with track and field in New York? Uh, so I was born in Queens, New York, but um, my mom was a single parent and she moved my sister and I to New Jersey. And that's pretty much where I grew up most of my life. And I wish that it was some amazing incredible story where the, the clouds parted and it was like god was like oh i jumped it wasn't like that they uh, i went to a predominantly white school and they were like "Ooh, tall skinny black girl let's get her in the high jump and that's literally how it started um i mean i ran track in middle school like pretty much it's just something that my mom could afford she needed to get all my energy out so i just was always running um i started actually in the 800 and i hated it and I was like 800. Yeah. Oh boy. Yes. And they swore up and down. My high school coach to this day swears that I could, I could have been an Olympic 800 meter athlete. And I was like, no, because I would, I would have quit. <laughs> let, let me just, let me just say my high school coach says the same thing that I don't understand what this thing is with high school coaches and everyone's an eight runner. We are not all eight runners. <laughs> no, like it's, it's a sprint now. It's not even like middle distance. It's a full out sprint. Nah, bro, mm -hmm. not happening. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, my coach in high school uh, saw me and, you know, remember those flip books that like you would flip and you could like see a moving image? Yeah. Like, Showing your age here. I, I don't. Look, that's how, <laughs> that's how I was taught to high jump. That's what that man did. He really? Was like, oh, this man. Is what it looks like. And I was like, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> And again, it was nothing, track and field was not a love or a passion of mine. It was something that I was good at. Um, my passions were always in theater and arts and acting and dancing and musical theater. And uh -huh. so my plan was to quit track as soon as I graduated, move back to New York, become, you know, a waitress, and then all of a sudden get discovered and become, you know, the next Beyonce. Like I was <laughs> just going to blow up. And that was literally legitimately my plan. And so I found out the, the hard way that college, before you even step on campus, you owe at least $80,000. Yeah. And I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, boo boo. We in my bank account, I got my, you know, my Applebee's money. I don't think I got any <laughs> in that bank. 
Um, and so for the second time in my life, somebody um, directly, I felt it, uh, doubted me. The first time was when I was growing up, um, when I started modeling and acting and stuff. But this time was very different because it, they said something personally to me of why I wasn't going to succeed. And so um, from that day, I was just like, I'm gonna get to college, I'm gonna go for free, I don't care how it is. So um, I started really caring. I started making sure that I did what was necessary. Um, I started focusing because I didn't want my mom to go into debt for my own education. Um, she, had raised, she had raised me, she had done a great job, she had sacrificed a lot, and so it was my time to step up. And so St. John saw me at, uh, what well, was Nike Nationals, and now is New Balance Nationals. And yeah, he was like, hey, you want to go to St. John's? And I was like, where are you? He was like, New York City. And I was like, done, I'll sign there. Wherever you need to be, I'll do it. And so that's pretty much how it happened. I see these signings today and I'm like, I didn't have a hat. I didn't have <laughs> one. I wasn't like, oh, 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 I'm going here. No, it wasn't like that. Hold on. I don't expect you to call names, but if, it's like if it were a movie, there's always that character like who motivates the main character, like you can't do this. Who is this person? Why is there always this he person? Was my who's a counselor. He oh was my god! Guidance counselor, and I went in and he's always a hater. I swear I don't know his name. I do not. I completely forget. And he was super nice, like super. I would never like speak ill of him because honestly, his negativity was like was the push that I. <laughs> so yeah. thank you, Boo Boo. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, because I was like, how do I get an athletic or an academic scholarship? And he was just like, your grades are okay, but if you really want an athletic scholarship, you're just not that talented. Like, you're not talented enough. Like, you don't have the marks. And so I was just like, mm, okay, what do I need to do? And he literally just laid it out, like, what the colleges wanted. And I was like, okay, bye. And that was it. From, like, the time that I left, from that track meet on, I was killing it. And everyone was like, you came out uh -huh. of nowhere. And I was like, yup, you're right. Cause this was not what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I say this all the time. I jump for money. Whether people like to hear it or not, I jump for the money. Like, I'm sorry. Like <laughs> if you put, if you put stacks in front of me, I'm gonna jump. <laughs> yeah, get I'm that get paper. Money, I'm gonna get over that bar. <laughs> I'm gonna get that booty over real quick. A little time. <laughs> <laughs> a little time. <laughs> okay. Um, and so before I get into the college piece, I'm curious because, uh, and maybe this is skipping forward, but whatever. Um, your podcast, you do whatever you want. I know. Right. You don't have to go in order. So with, with being American born and then representing Antigua and Barbuda, I always, I, I asked a couple of the, um, you know, our Jamaican athletes, mm -hmm. um, about the same thing. Cause I've seen this being a Caribbean athlete myself, American born athletes coming to represent their, their home country where their parents are from, or maybe where they were born with pride, I might add. Mm -hmm. And, and just facing in some ways, I want to say some kind of discrimination. It was like, you're not really from here. Um, yeah. did you, do you feel like you've encountered that at all? And it's, it's been in your way at all. Um, yeah, I've seen it on both aspects though on the American side and on the Antiguan side. Oh, wow. Well, I feel like from the American side, obviously I was trying for the 2012 Olympic trials and I didn't make it, but I didn't get last. Like I did a lot better and no one cared. No one, no one gave a damn. No one was reaching out being like, let me guide you. Like, let me help you. I think we see potential, nothing. My coach had advocated for me and he just, he felt bad because he was like, you did so much better than you were supposed to. I was supposed to, I was coming in 24 out of 24. I got seven. Like, it's not like I'm some scrub, like just, you know, I can't perform under pressure. So I didn't feel the love there. And then now it's like, I can't, it's hard to get sponsorship because I still live here. So who wants to sponsor somebody that represents a Caribbean island, but I still live here. So there's no, like, they're trying to make those ties is very difficult, um, especially in America. Like you can't even say Black Lives Matter. And how, why, was my how dare you? Like you know, one of these crazy things, and so that on um, that aspect is very difficult. But then you also um, have it on the Antiguan side, where yes, I feel that a lot of the athletes and maybe some of the coaches thought that I was doing this as like an out, as a way to get to the Olympics, and they don't realize what I went through with the U.S. And one, two, well, two, I didn't know I could do dual citizenship. I had not a clue. It wasn't something where social media was huge. 
Instagram came out when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> like my freshman year, like more junior year, something like that, we're like posting because we're so excited about Instagram. So that kind of knowledge wasn't really like known to me. I thought you had to be born there. And so my dad is from Antigua, Barbuda. My mom's from Dominican Republic. So I have Caribbean blood through and through. But I, I'm American, I'm American made, you know? And so for them, they're just like, she's a phony. She's a fake. She doesn't know about our island. And rather than being like, hey, we see your potential, let us, you know, if anything, use you to get you on the podium, to get our flag out there, like, and let us teach you about the culture. I had to do this all by myself. And did I feel slighted? A little bit, because I didn't w ever want to, I'm a very bubbly person. So when somebody's mean to me, I'm like, oh, I don't mean to do this. So, um, you know, going into that, it was a culture shock, but I love my island. I love being able to represent Antigua and Barbuda. It's something, especially for me, I had to put respect on Antigua's name. People were like, where's that? Excuse me? Yeah, Antigua yeah, yeah. Said Antigua and Barbuda. What? What are y'all doing? <laughs> what is happening? So it's one of those things where I wanted to, I've always been the underdog. And so a lot of people seem to count me out and yet I'm still there, I'm still fighting, and you still know my name. And so I wanted to make sure that everything I did was to put Antigua people first, the priority. Um, because at the end of the day, they're my people. They are, like, we're it, all family. You said your mom was from the Dominican Republic? Yes. So was there ever a thought in your head that maybe I should compete for the DR? Um, about 5%. But oh, yeah. my mom was the single mom that raised me. I knew, mm -hmm. I knew I was always surrounded by my Hispanic side. I was okay. not close with my father's side. I didn't know that side of me. And yeah. so if I was going to represent anywhere, I wanted to represent somewhere I didn't know. I wanted to be uncomfortable. I really did because right. there's two parts of me. It's 50-50. So I didn't want to just say I'm Dominican. I have two sides. And so I knew that side of me and I knew that, but I wanted to get to know my father's side and a part of me that honestly, I didn't know at all. And you got to go back and spend some time there. And I did. And it's funny because we, I mean, I tried so many times to try and, you know, tour the island and maybe do something with like the track team, but with, you know, unorganization and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a very organized on American time kind of thing. And oh, I'm, Lord, island I'm time. <laughs> I was like, why are we not on time? No. <laughs> That always hits me when I go back home because I forget, you know, I'm, I'm up here like, okay, okay, New York time, New York time. And then I go home and it's like, okay, this thing is at three o'clock. Bam, I'm there at 250. And then like people are showing up at 330, 345, one person, 415. I'm like, yo, why didn't y'all tell me? I could have been doing other things for an hour. Like, <laughs> island time. You're definitely on island time and the organization, it, it tends to be like overlooked. When, they, when athletes come back and try to do something with the community, they always feel like it has to be held by someone important. Well, not important, but one of the association members yeah. or someone that's a part of the board. And it's like, well, they can connect one-on-one -on -one with us because as an athlete, I can come from an athlete perspective. So of course, they'll feel closer to us. You just have to help organize certain things. And they just, sometimes they miss the ball with like how people can connect with the community a little bit more. And it's something that I think is definitely missing. They have mm -hmm. so many athletes, a lot of athletes, even if you're born on the island, they all come to college here, like in the US. They're always here, they spend four years here, and then we go back and it's something that I think there needs to be that connection. To be honest, I wish it was like the Caribbean versus the world. Like, like I really do, because if the we all get together, huh? The yeah. whole Caribbean against the world, that would be dope. Oh, ho, ho. Yeah. Oh, that would be pretty dope. What I'm but saying, that's how, like how um, the not the Commonwealth Games, the um, World Cup, the Continental Cup, yes, Continental yes, Cup, yes. Is somewhat like that. I think the Americas and then the Caribbean and then South America, etc. Yeah, sounds I think pretty I, good. I think we could come together as, as a put my money on the Caribbean. I would, too. <laughs> I would definitely too. people sleep, people sleep on the Caribbean. I'm gonna just say that one of the best, one of the greatest basketball players. Of all time, period. Period. Is from St. Croix is from St. Croix. That is Mr. Tim Duncan. Say something. Say he's not one of the best <laughs> ever. Say that. 
Okay, that's what I thought. I agree with you. I have to agree with you on that. <laughs> anyone that is arguing with that statement. No. Yeah, from St. Croix, a little tiny little island. There's a lot of folks in the Caribbean with some crazy talent with a lack of opportunity. Crazy talent. Crazy, crazy, crazy talent. And that's yeah. the thing. It's something that, like, small, not small thing, but something like communication is huge. And they don't, again, just use us. Be like, can you plan this? Can you do this? But it's drama. It's drama and it's politics because I try to go back and do stuff all the time. Politics. It's and I'll get someone saying something ignorant, like, oh, you're not really from here. I'm, and that gets me heated because I'm born, raised there, represent in the v, in the Olympics, do like, like bring generators back or whatever I can to help. And it's like, yeah. I get disregarded. It's like, because I don't maybe speak with a thick enough accent or because I'm living in the US. It's yeah. crazy. And you're My turning kids. away people who want to come home and help and do things. Oh, absolutely. And there's, I mean, I speak to CJ, my teammate all the time. And I'm like, as soon as we get a track, I want to host a camp. Like I want to do something mm. back for the kids. Um, but it was one of those things where I was at, oh, I don't even know what it was. It might've been the Olympics, but it was at a, at a games. And one of my teammates was like, we would like you better if you spoke like us. And I was just oh, that's it. one of those things where it's just like, really is that is is that what's keeping us apart because like that's that's so in a sense like racist like how are you going to yeah. tell me that you would like me better like these are the kind of things where i'm just like you know what i don't even care so yeah there's been a lot of things and you and i get a lot on top of my already difficult journey from both uh, sides culturally um yeah. and obviously the islands you know women are not you know the forefront they're not, I, I don't want to say sexism, but it is very much where the boys are a big dominant and especially in track and field, you know, we have cricket, that's just men, tennis, which is men. Um, you know, I was one of two women at the Olympic games, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you got to rep like, and so that's crazy. it's very difficult because, you know, track and field already favors the sprints like, or, you know, things on the track. So being a female, field eventer is not looking good in my favor. So it has been an uphill battle, um, but it just makes you stronger. It makes you realize where you're at and stuff. So I haven't really, lately, I haven't really taken it as a negative. And lately, as I'm, I mean, like the last five years. <laughs> but it's, it's, in my mind, it's crazy on their end because, you know, we and we were talking about this earlier, you know, you are bubbly and you do have a great personality. And to me, these are the things that our sport needs, you know? Like yeah. people could say what they want about Bolt or even if you go way back in the day when Mo Green had the fire extinguisher on his spikes, but it's track, I mean, amazing. track needs some rivalries. It needs personality. It needs yeah. drama. And it needs people who are enthusiastic, have energy and who people like to watch and follow. And so in my mind, they would be better off investing in you because at the end of the day, who's paying attention to Antigua track and field. But if they're so <laughs> investing in you, then at least you, you know, you're someone that people are going to see and be like, Oh man, that's, you know, you're bringing attention to the sport. We told them about um, my dad's friend. He had made a whole pitch about how I could like help with tourism and yeah. all kind of stuff. Nothing just fell to the wayside. Cause it just wasn't important. Like it really wasn't. And so for me, I've realized that, you know, um, even CJ was like, you know, like, I hope you can get back and get healthy so that, you know, you can, they can put respect on your name. And I was like, I already have respect on my name. I know who I am. I know what I'm doing. I've done amazing things. And if somebody doesn't want to value me, that's on them. That has nothing to do. That's your missed opp opportunity. I know yeah. that I know who I am and I'm not going to change. And that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to change. And I was like, eh, I don't got time. <laughs> that's who I am. Um, I'm not going to apologize for for who I am. I represent Antigua and Barbuda. I rep my flag very proudly. Um, and I feel like I've brought them great medals and a lot of notoriety. So um, I've done my job in that aspect. So if they they want to drop the ball, then that's on you, boo-boo. Keep, keep going. Yep, they dropped the NFL flats. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I love seeing when like track athletes, like that Mo um clip that was on like espn on like one of like their reels i'm like okay so i was like you y'all can get mad all you want but that boy is making he did what he had to do and he was proud and that's the thing i'm like us athletes we're entertainers that's mm -hmm. why i understood track because it was my own lane and i was an entertainer that's what i want to do i want to be an actress i want to be out there this was a, this is my stage this is what i do i'm not going to come 
looking bland, looking a hot mess. No, no, boo boo. I'm coming mm-hmm. correct every track me. I'm coming. I'm looking fly every time. Um, and, and sorry. So something that they didn't like was I, I truly believe they didn't like my purple hair. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. A bit much, but I mean, like we've had this argument in British Virgin Isles, and they finally understood. But when you stand up on the stage and they're you know, pan in the camera and they see your flag, they automatically start saying like British Virgin Islands or Antigua and Barbuda, where's this? Let me look this up. And then if we have 2.5 plus million viewers each time, this is free to support your athletes and they can put you and it's free marketing. We're basically sport ambassadors and ambassadors for our country. So just invest in your athletes because you can spend over 100K on marketing initiatives for tourism. Mm-hmm. Or you can do that, and they can do this multiple times because we race like well when the Diamond League was on or whatever, and Olympics, etc. Those we are in front of millions of people. Less than a hundred k. So just imagine where you could put your funds at. No, you're you're absolutely right, Ashley. Definitely, um, folks not taking advantage of the marketing opportunities. But my my thing is that the gatekeepers of the sport. That's the problem. They there's this old puritanical approach to this like you have to conduct yourself in this manner you have to wear uniforms that look like this and you have to and it's like nah that's not really what brings people in like it's okay to celebrate and be cocky and loud and and have your hair different colors and wear different color stuff like bring that energy to the sport that's what brings in the younger generation like even if you look on social social media yeah you have a culture like I remember the guy who was like oiled up. Remember him? And he had like the grass skirt. He was like oh, everywhere. Who? Um, yeah. No, no, no. He was <laughs> oh. like the opening oh. ceremony and they had like their, uh, it, it wasn't like Samoan, but they, he had like, he was like, he had, he was shirtless. He was the, he was the flag bearer. Yeah. He was shirtless. He was oiled up and he had like this grass skirt. And I was like, he didn't have to do anything but be exactly who his country, who his culture is. And that's what we have. The Caribbean has everything when it comes to culture and colors and flair. And like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm like, this would have been amazing. Every year, like every country, they should go back into the islands and say, all right, who's a designer? Who, a hometown person gets to design the Olympic opening ceremony? Yeah. And we all yes. come together with the colors and stuff like this. I'm like, they're missing out. Oh, See, man. Lucia did it. And I was like, man, they did it for the Commonwealth Games. And it was it was beautiful. They had like different custom gowns. It was amazing. But like they miss out on all these things. And I know for me, the purple hair had nothing to do with standing. Like it wasn't like something kind of like publicity glimmer. Just uh, being yourself. It was, it was, for, it was honestly, my mom was like, how am I going to tell you apart from everybody else? I was like, <laughs> okay. And my, my, my boyfriend at the time, Went to LSU. So I was like, all right. (laughs) So that's what happened. But Ashley, you're right. They missed out on an opportunity because I went viral on Twitter. And I was like, y'all could have used that. Like, but at the same time, you did have on your Antigua and Bermuda. I think the buns had the Antigua and the Bermuda at the bottom. For that picture that's like on IWF and everything, I think that one has Antigua and Bermuda on your buns. Um, Yeah. They could have invested in you and well, they got free publicity out of it at the same time, but they should have seen that as an opportunity that they can push this person even further if she had the kind of financial backing that she deserves. But I mean, that's something like I felt, I feel like a lot of the athletes and you'll see it on my like social media, social media. And it's crazy. Like the, what the papers print about like some of the athletes and it's 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 a little disrespectful what they do to the athletes they're like you know they're put they're pinning athletes against each other and you know they're saying different things like oh why does he have a GoFundMe and like they're just taking things out of context and I'm just like you know what you're not you're not doing yourself any favor and you're not it's it's like petty it's so like high school I'm like you're an organ like we're an organization, we're representing on the global scale. And so for me, I really had to take myself out of it and just focus on myself representing the flag and representing the people rather than getting caught up in the politics and all that stuff, because it starts to drain you. I was fighting for so long just to get on Olympic solidarity. And now that I am, I'm very, very grateful. Honestly, I really am. But if I told anybody that I made $12,000 a year as my salary, They'd be like, you need a new job. You need a new career. 
<laughs> like, what are you doing? So for me, I'm very, very grateful. Obviously the money helps me, but it's a lot harder of a journey. Um, do I hate it? No, I learned a lot about myself, how strong I can be, how resilient I can be, but it definitely put a bitter taste in my mouth. And that's why I am, everyone's like, are you like, why are you so ready to retire? I'm like, cause I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of living, you know, at the very bottom, but having to compete at the very top. So this summer I am, hallelujah, if I can get there, I am ready to be done. <laughs> to have a paycheck with a couple couple more zeros in it yeah yeah exactly <laughs> well a lot of folks don't realize the differences in events when it comes mm -hmm. to pay on the on the national on the international level you know not all events are are created equal when it comes to that you know if you're the if you're runner up at world champ at the world champs in the hundred versus the high jump oh yeah it's different it's like forty five thousand versus what what do you guys 12 i don't even know i'm oh. not yeah and then what the contrast, yeah. say is that you can you live at the bottom but you compete at the top yeah and you constantly have to compete with people who have entourages of health medical staff at their beck and call they get massages they get everything they can supplement right they can possibly mm -hmm. have nutrition etc but you still have to step up and you made the olympic games so what is your mentality when you go into those type of games and you know you have to step up and be among the best because another thing that you said earlier is you went into the U U.S. Olympic trials at 24, ranked 24, and you came out at seven. So it had to be a level of focus, a level of just like, I'm that, oh, this is a podcast. So I'm that B-I-T-C-H. Yes. So I can do this and I can level up with anyone that is in front of me. So what was your mindset going into those type of um, arenas and experiences? I am a badass warrior. And oh. I, period. Or the kids say per now, per. Uh, <laughs> I am so resilient. And it doesn't, the greatest thing about track and field is that every track meet, anything can happen. So for me, I don't really care what other people say. I don't really think about it. I did for a small portion of my career because I was so worried about what my agent was gonna say if I was gonna get invited to the next meet, if I was making enough money. And I realized it was stealing my joy, it was stealing my competition and I wasn't concentrating on what I was supposed to be doing. And so, and then I began to hate track. And then I realized, I was like, why do I, why am I letting outside opinions determine who I am? how they don't know how hard I train. They don't know what I've overcome. They don't know what I've been through. They don't know how amazing and incredible I am. So especially when I was at the 2012 Olympia, the US trials, I was in there as a kid having the time of my life. That's exactly what you saw. I was dancing. I was having a great time because I was 24 out of 24. And then all of a sudden I'm tied for first. Never in my life did I ever expect that to happen, but I was just enjoying myself. I was having fun. I didn't care who was there. I didn't even know half the field. I was like, I don't know you. I'm in college. I'm having a great time. So, and in these moments that I realized, you know, especially after the Olympics, I realized that I, there was a part of me that, that wasn't a hundred percent because I was so focused on not having money. I was focused on not being sponsored. I was focused on everybody else getting something better than I was. I was upset that people knew that I went to the Olympics and all they asked was, did you, did you bring home a medal? Uh, why aren't you on the Wheaties box? I'm like, like it was never enough. And so, and this is like basic people, obviously you have no idea. So I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna just do me and I'm gonna have a good time. So now when I go into meets, I've worked, I've done the best that I can do. I can't, I can't outwork anybody but myself. This is my journey. This is my story. And I need to be a hundred percent confident going into every single meet. I can be, I mean, right now I'm injured technically. Like I haven't been able to train. Am I thinking I'm not getting to the games? Absolutely not. I'm envisioning, I'm visualizing myself there at the games and looking at all these other little, little girls being like, y'all can just go home because this is my arena. Everybody came to see me. So it's might as well just go ahead with your boring little self and your little attitude and let me work. That's exactly how I am all the time. And I think 
what happens is, especially in the younger generation that I'm seeing, is that they're, one, comparing themselves to everybody on social media. Can't do that. Can't do that at all. Um, I'm going to be honest. I did that this summer while I was lifting weight. I'm going to show you. One second. <laughs> this is real life stuff. This is what I lifted. It is an empty water bottle with sand because I live by the beach. This is what I was lifting with, okay? It's about eight pounds. And I saw people getting shipments of weight rooms delivered to their garage. Yep. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, is comparing my situation helping me? No. Is it doing anything beneficial for me? Nope. So I had to change that mindset. My entire view changes with everything. I take the Olympic mindset and I put it into my everyday life. If that's not bringing me joy, if it's not helping me, if it's not there for me, it's none of my business. Keep scrolling. It doesn't matter. You're mm -hmm. still going to be the champ. It don't matter. This is making my 30 for 30 even better. This is making my, my movie where Beyonce stars as me even better. These are all the, I just don't care. I just don't have the time. If it's going to steal my energy, I just don't have the time for it. So I, I definitely have changed my perspective. I've changed how I speak to myself. Everything has changed because what I watch on television, what I listen to on the radio, what I see on social media, the interviews that I do, people that I interact with, if you're not here for me, if you're not providing me with some sort of love, energy, positivity, then you're not, you're not allowed near me. That's just the way it is. Yeah, I think all of that that you said is important. And yes, we know you went through college, you were a St. John's Hall of Famer and everything. But I think that your tra trajectory after the Olympics and how you took advantage of that opportunities and made sure that you were in the business field, you took advantage of this opportunity to leverage other financial opportunities, et cetera. I think that is very, that will resonate a lot with our, our listeners. So talk about just how you capitalize on social media. Well, how you first thought of capitalizing on social media and then what did that do for your confidence and also just your career in general? I realized that I didn't know how to invest in like with money and stocks. And I knew that if you invest money, it grows. So for me, I was like, all right, I just got to invest in myself. That's it. Time, energy, focus, dedication. Um, I started reading books. I started doing a little bit of research and I didn't have that much money. So if the book was more than $10, I couldn't afford it. So I was just trying to figure out anything that was free or cheap that I could get my hands on. And I was doing a lot of networking. I was trying to talk to anybody that was doing better than me. And it wasn't like, oh, tell me all your secrets. It was just, hey, how are you? How's it going? Love you, you know, love what you're doing. How's it going? Saw you partnered with this person. How's that going? Mm -hmm. People see when you become very interested in other people, they start to open up because they know that you, you're invested in yourself and you're trying to learn. So little things like that, but it does, the number one thing is it takes time. It does. I got a blue check at the Olympics. That's kind of a cheat code. It is. It was my cheat code. Took eight years in the making, but <laughs> so I don't know how much of a cheat code it is, but that's one of the things that did help me. So that I may have not gotten a gold medal, but a blue check was pretty significant. I'll just say I'm a little salty about not having this blue check. Ashley? I'm still waiting on my blue check. They're I athletes. Is it? Where is it? They're athletes who are on our team who have blue checks. I don't have a check. <laughs> What's going on with this check? I saw one, and then um, one of my basketball friends has a blue check, and I was just like, "I'm a whole American, all American, Olympian, about to make my second Olympics. How do you get a blue check? You just went overseas for one year." Guy like, coach what? has a blue check. I swear. I don't know how people got a blue check. It was a friend of mine. She was dating someone at the time, and he. <laughs> knew somebody at Facebook and I was having a horrible day at the games. Like I was super depressed, super upset. Something had happened. And um, I guess like they were like talking to each other and he was just like, Hey P I know you're having a really bad day. Check your Instagram. And it was there. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> um, you, still you still have his contact information? Cause I'm looking for you. No, it's all good. I'm going to get it this year. DJ Tokyo happens. I'm oh, trust. I'm like, I'm, I'm banking on making sure that my blue check is known. I'm about to put up. <laughs> what they did in Rio with the USA team is they like went to a tent and was like, all right, all everyone come in here. Everybody get your blue got check. a blue check. 
And I'm watching them like, what's going on over there? And I know, but some here. people got it taken away. <laughs> That's bad. Really? Right? So let's all come. Let's all get your blue check <laughs> removed, though. Oh, man. The one thing that was free. <laughs> they're like they're like i'm sorry you're not good enough you you didn't even you just came as an alternate but I, I mean, it was one of those things where i was very lucky i was very blessed um but again i mean i did i i completely consider myself a hustler like i i, I keep hustling no matter From what Queens. Uh, it's, I guess that's it. I guess it's just in my DNA. And the island jeans and the you can't island be an island person from Queens and not be a hustler. I have, I have, I have like three jobs at yeah. least. <laughs> right now, exactly. Right now I have like four jobs. Yes. So what I did was, I like I have so many jobs, but like to become, and I do not con consider myself an influencer. I'm a content creator. That's what I will uh -oh. call. I am not an influencer. I'm not one of these basic people that I just can do things that I, I do I'm not gonna just, I, I'm just, I'm just saying I was scrolling through one of these social media apps and I saw you on a commercial for some cereal. Yeah. And I was like, what, what's going on? What is this? So I'm about to, oh damn. I can't tell you all my secrets. <laughs> I saw this brand and it was a cereal and it had protein in it, like a good amount. And I was like, okay. So I put out a story and I was like, has anybody tried this? And they messaged me and were like, hey, we'd love to send you some cereal. And I said, okay, got the cereal. And I forgot about it. And I got so excited and reels had just been created. So mm -hmm. I was like, I'm gonna do a reel. Why not? It's the trend. Why not do it? And I did this video, like this fun little thing. And they loved it. Like that was it. Now, flip the, flip the, like the switch. I, had, I used to have a publicist going into the Olympic year thinking, I, I need help. I need somebody to help guide me. My husband took out a loan to pay for this publicist. She reached out to that cereal company and said, hey, this you liked her content. You know that she can create it. She's had a lot of feedback on it. Would you like for her to be a, you know, a paid content creator? No. Yeah, they're trying to get everything free. No. Or they can send you any kind of gifts. That's yeah. all they want. Like, no, your value is more than that. Yeah, so, and that's when I stopped. So that's the last thing. Like, they they, they just reached out um, and said, like, oh, do you want to leave a review on our page? No. Our, our, it gets millions of views. Oh. Uh, we can send her cereal. No. No, no, no. no. We, we don't Keep do your that. your protein here. cereal. Exactly. So then I was dead because everyone kept on reaching out, like, hey, we would love to support the cereal. Do you have, like, a link, like, a code? Oh, we're just going to track it. We can track it. And I was just like, whatever. I had like, I don't know, 200, 300,000 view, like, views on it. Nothing. So I was like, forget it. I'm done. So you have to know your value. And that's something that like, again, research time, working with the publicist. But a lot of the times it's just me interacting. Because that's what I love about my social media page. Because I've always wanted my own reality show. So it's allowing me to interact with people on a very real level. And that's the key thing. People think that you're just putting out content and being the Kardashians. That's uh, not it. You have to interact with these people that are following you and investing in you. Uh -huh. So that was one of the things that I did. Um, and I, you know, I do, I, I did have a publicist. I cannot, I can no longer afford her. Um, but a publicist does help you a lot. So if that's something that you want to save for mm -hmm. and invest in, that's a great investment in yourself because she helped me hone in my brand and help mm -hmm. me understand what needs to be done. And I, honestly, raise my value. Because for me, I was like, oh, I'd love free cereal. She was like, no, boo-boo, you can do more than that. <laughs> and so, you know, and so I partnered with certain things. To me, to be honest, I can't content create unless I really love a brand. And that's yeah. something people just be like, oh, they're throwing money at me. I want to do it. I've turned down a lot of things. And I was just like, I'm never going to wear that. I'm never going to use that. Oh, you want to wear my waist trainer? Oh, my God. the waist yeah. trainers. We don't do that in track and field. No, no, boo boo. Mm -mm, yeah. That's not us. We work for this. We can do abs. We can do actual sit ups. Like we do things like mm -hmm. this. So like there's a lot of things that you have to just know your brand and your and your and your value. Um, I network a lot. I try to talk. I do a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of motivational speaking and it helps me. I work on my craft. There's a lot of, I started my own podcast because I knew that I needed more time 
outside of track to work on after track. I'm always thinking of after track. Even though my I obviously my eyes are set on the Olympics, I have to be prepared for what's right after. And so I have, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Um, and so I'm hustling. I'm trying to train for the 2022 Winter Olympics and be the first female Antigua Barbuda athlete to represent um, at the Winter Olympics in the monobob. I am, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm super excited about that. And I'm like, watch courses. I'll just watch the courses, watch them drive from the first person view so I can understand how to do it because I'm not cleared to train. Um, I obviously started my own nonprofit. I wanted to make sure that I gave back. I have, I just started a new job at a radio station so that I can be in the entertainment side and I can learn the board so that when I retire, I can go into somewhere and be like, I have experience. I know what I'm doing. Just let me work, boo. Um, I'm obviously training and I own my own business. I, instead of complaining about not having enough money, I started my own cl home, um, home cleaning and organization business. And so these are the things that I just, I was tired of complaining. If I want something, I need to be the change that I want to see. So I got good at it. I, I study it and I just don't, I mean, I rest by like, cause my body needs it. But if there's a moment that I could be reading, if I could be bettering myself, you best damn believe I'm be bettering myself. Mm -hmm. Man, I hope y'all listening to this, man. Y'all getting all kind of free information. We don't charge y'all or nothing. Y'all just getting all of it straight from the source, oh, straight listen. from the Olympians themselves. No. Y'all hear this? She just told y'all everything. You <laughs> over here at home complaining about you ain't got no money. And she over here working four jobs, training for the Olympics this year, planning for the Olympics next year. Come on. Mm -hmm. I just, I really, you, look, I've had so many people count me out. And I just thought the one person that can't is me. I, I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let my mom down. I don't want to let my country down. And I don't want to let my husband down. These are people that have invested in me. And so I need to invest in myself. And so, again, I didn't get these big checks. Okay. Oh, well. Um, I did start a GoFundMe because other people convinced me that people wanted to help me. I was like, no, I'm embarrassed. I was totally embarrassed doing it. People have asked me to promote it on their show. And I'm like, mm, I don't really want to. They were like, how come you don't ask for more money? I was like, I just need a little bit of help. Like, I feel horrible asking. I feel it's not their job. It's not their, like, but I realized if, you know, they're buying Nikes and Nike pays an athlete. And if they just want to pay me directly, okay. <laughs> So I have, I literally have, I think 55 people have donated. Now I have 55 sponsors. Yes, ma'am. I love it. it. So there was something else that I saw you had done. You had a piece that was out. This is very interesting. It was a piece yeah. with, um, that you did with CNN. Yes. Um, on uh, body issues, body image issues. Yes. And um, you've had some experiences. Uh, you said you were uh, modeling before and you were told <laughs> that you were too heavy. And I guess yeah, you've encountered this before. Face. Yes, they told me I had a fat face. I photographed fat. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so tell us about this piece that you did with CNN. It was absolutely amazing. And I will say there was a 55% chance that I was going to pull it because mm -hmm. coaches that I asked to speak were like, well, don't say that. Like, don't say that I said that. Don't, I, I didn't, I don't remember saying that. And I was like, all right. Yeah. And I thought to myself, am I making this up? Like I, for a moment, I was like, am I crazy? Like, did this not happen? Like why? And then I realized that they were going to be held accountable. And so mm -hmm. I said, forget it. Just pull their name from the article. This is about me. I don't need them. I don't need their, you know, whatever. So I'm going to do this. And so I, um, I've dealt with body issues for, since I was about 13 years old, starting in modeling. And that's when my mom pulled me out. Cause I was in pageants. I did modeling. I did the whole thing. And then my mom realized it's the one really bad memory I have with my father because he came, he never was in my life, but he came to like certain little blimps and mm -hmm. he came to the one and I had cut my hair mm -hmm. and it was like a pixie cut. I look cute. I was, <laughs> I was looking cute. And I made the last five. So I was part of the last five and I lost. And I remember him being like, why did you like tell to my mother, why did you let her cut her hair? And it was one of those things where I was just like, oh, what a jerk. Like it was one of those things. And so from there it's, you know, and coming from a single mom and not having that kind of male, like, you know, help, like knowing that you're beautiful, no matter who you are, what size you are, that kind of stuff. My mom worked in New York. She was a banker. 
she was killing it. She had, you know, the stilettos and the cute outfits. So appearance was very important to her. And so it was very important to me watching it and growing up. And so America's Next Top Model, I went on, I, you know, I auditioned. It was like, a, you know, cattle calling and I never, there was nothing. And so I was like, man, I'm just not pretty enough. My mom was like, oh, nope, we're done. She pulled me out right away. She was like, we're not doing this. This is not how we're doing it. And so, um, but, you know, in school, I was one of the only black girls. I dated a white kid and I was bullied. I was bullied all the time for that. So then I was just like, oh my gosh. So like, I just never felt comfortable being who I was. I was like, damn, like, can bitch live? Like, geez, <laughs> my life, you know? And so, and then it got to college and my coach was like, he said something about like watching what we ate and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, why do people care so much about what we eat and like what we're doing? And, um, and I would see pictures and I would start to compare myself and I realized that I wanted to act. And so I asked the nutritionist how I can be anorexic and be able to be a track athlete. And I didn't, I didn't put any weight to that. And she was petrified. And I was like, whoa, what happened? What's wrong? <laughs> just like this, this, this really just bad relationship with how I am and how I look. And, um, and then when I became a pro, it got worse. I mean, I remember my teammates saying, oh, I, you know, you're looking a little thick at the Commonwealth Games. I was so excited in 2018 because I finished like fifth and I finished like 30th the, the couple of years before. So I was like, I'm doing great. And we're at the bar and this guy's like, oh, I saw you on TV. If you lost a couple of kilos, you would have done better. Who are these people? Where is <laughs> who are like, these people? <laughs> like, it, it just doesn't, it like rolls off their tongue. Mm -hmm. And then I just started calling myself. I was like, all right, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the big high jumper. I'm the fattest one out here. I don't care. Cause I mean, when they pan, you've seen high jumpers. I look very different. So then I started obsessing and there was this one day I was driving home and I started Googling how tall all my competitors were and how much they weighed and their age. And I was heavier by 20, 30 pounds. These girls were like 5'11", 115 pounds, you know, six foot two, 138 pounds. And I'm 5'10", and 158 pounds. And I was just like, I'm fat, I'm fat. And then it, something amazing. I looked up the Olympic gold medalist, Ruth from Spain. She's mm -hmm. five, 10 and a half. And she weighed like 157 pounds. And I was just like, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I have no idea what I weigh when I compete. Not a clue. How would I know? I could have jumped my PR being the heaviest I ever was, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm basing it off of looks. And so, I mean, I remember my coach had advised, my, my former coach was like, oh yeah, when I was high jumping, we would just drink a pot of coffee and dehydrate us and we would be ready to go. So I started doing that. I was just drinking massive amount. And everybody knows I love coffee. So I'm just always having it, always having it right before me. Cause if I didn't feel light and thin, I was never gonna jump well. So these are the kind of things that I just put in my head. And I started obsessing about food. Um, I wouldn't allow myself a lot of things. And then if I did, I'd be like, I don't care. I'm having a donut and would have like six. And I just was so angry. So like this whole thing just kept on going back and forth. And again, I had to change the narrative for myself. Um, I started working with a female coach and a female sports psychologist and it just changed. Everything changed. My whole outlook changed. Um, and it's something that I have a good handle on now. I just, I don't care. I really don't. This is who I am. This is what I, I don't know what I compete at, like my weight. And so if I don't know that, then, oh, well. Yeah. You do great. As long as I'm working out, um, you know, staying on my nutrition plan, doing well. Um, and half the time it's like, I'm not eating enough. So mm -hmm. it's more of just like, you're trusting people who aren't experts. You wouldn't trust a baker to fix your car. So why are you trusting regular behind muggle people uh, telling you what you look like in your sport. So for me, I know I compete in a sports bra and underwear. I look damn cute. My abs are sometimes there, sometimes not. Sometimes. My, sometimes my itty bitty boobies are, you know, looking perfect. They don't sag. They don't, my booty's looking cute. I'm good. I don't care. So for me, it was more of a, again, it's all these trials and tribulations led to these amazing discoveries and it's just making me more of this superhero warrior and so for me I'm not mad at it 
I don't always want my narrative or my story to be like, oh, what was me? Like, no, I had a bad moment. Now I'm back. Like I rise, I rise, boo boo. Well, doing that piece, I mean, with CNN, I mean, it, you know, that story I'm sure is not just unique to you. I'm sure there are countless people out here dealing with these types of issues um, constantly. And so, you know, you having the courage to get out there and put your story out there. It really helps because, I mean, I can't look at you and say you're big. I personally, I wouldn't be like, oh man, she's big, she's fat. So I'm like, wow, that's, you know. Oh yeah, I remember one of, the coaches, one of the coaches at uh, Nash, uh, yeah, Nationals and when I was in college, I was about to have like an ice cream the day before I compete. And he, like my coach was right there. I'm right there, I'm buying the ice cream. He was like, put that back. You're about to compete tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, as a coach, you would advise, like if you have a, I mean, I think it's a very tender subject when it comes to female athletes, because as men athletes, you can tell them like, listen, you're not at 4% body fat, you need to get down, etc. With females it's a little bit more te- delicate because we have hormones, we go through different changes with our bodies. We all, we also have like innate um ideas of what our body should look like because we're constantly pressured to hold to uphold this standard of beauty so as coaches they could say something and it could be completely completely malicious free it's just genuine and just like listen at this stage there's certain things that you have to be you have to your body fat has to be at this um etc so you can say you it's easy to say that oh you know if it was my coach i would have been been like all right but it wasn't. You don't know who I am. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're coming out of somewhere like, and who, like, look at, um, what's his name? The football player. He eats candy all the time. All the time. He has a Skittle man that comes to the, like, to the, Skittles are not a nutritious plan if you're about to go play, but everybody's different. So mm-hmm. if, it, if it was my coach, and if my coach is there being like, yeah, sure, you can have an ice cream. It won't kill you. Like, Maybe that's part of my, new, maybe it's a good luck charm. Maybe I always had a bite of ice cream. You don't know if I was going to eat the whole thing. Like, you don't know. But like, just to come out and be like, if, if some random person just came up to anybody and was just like, really? You going to eat that? I don't think so. Well, You're like, back up. I'm about to die. <laughs> yeah. No, I'd say, man, you know, if you're a high level athlete, listening to anybody about anything is probably, you know, that's outside your coach because people come up all the time with their nonsense. Oh man, you know, you can tie some bricks to your feet and run in the sand. That's what we used to do back in 1948. Like, just, just stop. Just stop with your nonsense. It's so, so, true. so if they're not, they do, they do. So they, I don't, that's why I'm like, people are coming up to you saying this like that. That sounds it's like you're not. And even if you're, but let me say this, having coached women as well. Yes. yes, it is a little more delicate of a subject, but you can communicate it in ways that's not, you know, coming at somebody, you know, and making them feel like you're beating them up. Um, and so I think I that's think important. I think the problem is a lot of, especially male coaches, they don't know, they don't truly know nutrition. They don't <laughs> yeah. know nutrition. They're saying carbs is fat. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's like this movie. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like this old school mentality of like, if, if you're going to say something, educate yourself. Like, no, <laughs> carbs are fat. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just all these kind of things. Uh, just, like, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I yeah. trust if, if you're a nutritionist and you study this, fine. Like, how many of us in high school would have pasta dinners? That was like the thing to do. Mm-hmm. Nobody really knew that you don't need to, like, only if you're a cross country athlete. We were having pasta dinners before a track meet because we didn't know. So like, for me, I'm like, if you're a nutritionist and if you're a coach and you don't know, then it's time to hire a nutritionist for your team. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's good to default to people with expertise anyway. As a coach, I'm an expert in strength and conditioning. I have (laughs) expertise in nutrition and my degree covered a, a lot of things, but I will always default to someone who that's their primary expertise. So if someone's communicating with me about, oh, you know, I don't know what I should eat. I can give you good general information like bam, bam, bam. But if it gets, if we're going in depth, I'm like, no, please contact this person. We'll work with you and put together a plan. I'm not going to give you something just, you know, throwing darts. Yeah, that's what a lot of coaches do. A lot of coaches are just like, this is how I did it back in the day. Yeah, nah, like, nah, nah. okay, bro, whatever. So <laughs> it's one of those things, like, I think that's what's making me more upset. Like, stay in your lane, stay in your lane, coach me, let me know. And it's like, if I mean, you're an expert in strength and conditioning, 
you've seen some of these coaches out here in the weight room and you're like, Hey oh, man, Hey, don't, God. don't get me started. <laughs> don't <laughs> get me podcast, Priscilla. started. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, listen, the stuff I see coaches do, I just, we could I, have a whole series on what coaches please. shouldn't do. Good Lord. I, I'm telling you. So trust, that's a perfect example of just like stay in your lane. All you gotta do <laughs> If you don't know, it's okay to say you don't know. It's all right. Yes. It's okay to keep your mouth closed. It's all right. <laughs> Point you in a different direction. But yeah, so I mean, um, I loved sharing my story. I was terrified, like couldn't sleep the night before and seeing the response, I was blown away. It was well-received, I bet. It was, it was so amazing. There were women yeah. who were like cancer survivors who had reached out. Um, obviously athletes and Mary Kane obviously honestly gave me that courage a little bit, gave me that extra push to be like, just do it. Because the problem is there, you're right. A lot more people are dealing with this and no one would ever know that I was dealing with this. No one would ever know that Mary Kane was dealing with it. Um, obviously Mary Kane's was so much worse, so much worse. Um, because at a certain point I was like, F you coach, I don't really give a damn, <laughs> but she was in this environment that was just horrible. So I wanted to tell my story. I wanted to share my truth. That was my, the name of my show over the summer, speak my truth. And so that's what I do now. I just got to tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times folks, and I'm going to say, especially black folks, man, we're used to hiding emotions, hiding feelings, hiding, just hiding all of these things because we feel, and they do that. They make us vulnerable in the real world and they get used against us. You know, as a black male, I feel like if I'm upset at something, justifiably upset at something, I'm not allowed to express that because if I do express that, that human emotion that I'm going to be judged and perceived a certain way, it fits some stereotype that I will not allow people to put me in. So I have to keep everything contained and you get used to doing that every day and everything that you do and hiding it when sometimes if you let it out other people who are who are dealing with it are like man I'm glad that person like opened that door for me so that it's like I'm not alone I'm not the only one feeling this way I'm not the only one going through this so you being able to do that no matter how scary it was it helped a lot of people in a lot of ways man that's you know that's all I want to do I just yeah. want to be the change that I wanted to see and help so many, especially young athletes. There's so much out there today and I can only imagine what they're going through. So just to give them a little bit of light, love and confidence is all yeah. I truly really want to do. That's what yeah. the, that's the legacy I would like to leave behind. Yeah. Especially and, and, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so you said you're not clear to train. You were dealing with some stuff the past couple of months. Now you've been, you've got COVID and yeah. you've been dealing with it since you said January. January 17th, I tested positive. They said I was clear to go back uh, the end of January. So I had to stay home for 10 days and then I was good to go. Um, I kept on having chest pains and the doctor that I've been working with was like, all right, as long as you have no symptoms, you can get back to training slowly but surely. We're going to follow the college protocol. And one day I was just like, oh, I'm not the person to be like, oh, I'm hurt. I'm injured. I'm like, I'll fight through. I'll get, I'll get better. It'll be okay. This is, I'm not the only person dealing with this, but I kept on having chest pains and they got worse and they got all, they were all the time. And so I was like, Hey, I'm still having kind of chest pains. He was like, Oh, stop. You need to go get this taken care of. So I went to urgent care. I got an EKG. They sent me to the hospital. So the hospital, I was in there for like five, six hours, EKG, chest film, all this kind of stuff. Everything came back negative. And everyone was like, yay. And me, I was like, no, something's wrong. What is happening? So what are we in January, February, March, uh, four or five doctors later, um, countless of blood, you know, blood work, chest, all this, you know, all this kind of stuff that I had to go through. And lastly, I got um, an MRI of my heart and um, uh, they finally figured out I had inflammation of my heart muscle and it could be fatal. And so if I continue to change, train, and that was the biggest shock because when they, when he called and said that, he was like, I'm sorry, I cannot clear you to train for the Olympics. I don't see you going to the Olympics. I think you need to shut it down. I was devastated that whole weekend. I was like, I didn't even know, like, again, a content creator, I didn't even know what to post. I was posting things from like, you know, years ago. And I was posting anything because I was just like, I just, I bought a bottle of rosé. 
a bag of M and M's and I just sat on my couch. I was like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what do I do now? What is my life? I have to tell everyone that I'm no longer training. It was, it was just so out of my hands. And so um, two days after that, they got a call from a specialist. Uh, because these doctors, thankfully, really cared about my story and reached out to different people. And so these specialists were like, I don't think you have to retire. I think it's going to require a steroid. And, um, and I said, well, I have to go through WADA to get it approved and all kinds of stuff. So tomorrow, I drive three hours to North Jersey to go visit this doctor. And I'm hoping that I get the okay, I hope that I get what I need so that I can start. Cause I mean, again, I'm, I'm like, if this was in a regular world, there'd be no way that I'd be able to make the games. But I worked my ass off this last year. I spent thousands of dollars so that I could train with my, with my coach. Um, I moved away from my husband. I sacrificed everything. I cleared out my bank account. Uh, you know, it's like these things that I did and I didn't stop training. Like I did not. And so I'm hoping that that'll last and that God will give me the, the courage and the confidence to just compete at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. that's, so that's what I'm dealing with right now. I haven't, uh, I mean, I did, I was training when they said, okay, like you can compete at, uh, you can train at 30%. So I tested, I was in the gym. And so I guess two weeks ago, um, I only had dropped 10 pounds in my power clean yeah from 195 to 185 my squat stayed the same um so i was really happy about that so um i just hope that all the hard work and everything um again makes my 30 for 30 even better because when my chain's swinging when i get that medal yeah. <laughs> i won't be able to tell me nothing i was yeah. a whole mood <laughs> Uh, we got to get that. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get that metal, man. Yeah. <laughs> Time to get that gold though, man. No more silvers. We're done with that. Oh, I know. Yeah. But now it's like I got a big accomplishment. So don't forget that. Just Thank making you. the games after everything that you have um, went through, it would definitely be a big accomplishment. So don't neglect that either. Oh no, I'm totally, I just want to make it so that I can be that representation of yes. no matter what doctors say, no matter what is against you, like, you just got to keep, and right now, that's what I'm going through. Like, no matter what happens, like, I am so proud of myself and my journey and what I've been through. And if I can't compete, then, you know, everything happens for a reason, you know, and I'm super, super blessed. It's not that I'm done. I still have a thousand things to do. I still have to go to stunt school. I'm going to start <laughs> acting. I'm doing all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, um, I might have to like go down to Georgia for a little bit and do some Tyler Perry films and I'm auditioning for what I do. Like, there's just so many things. It's like, I'm ready. I know I got to jump in and list a couple more things because you do do a lot. And we and, and I want to mention it before you go because I don't want to take up all your time. But so you have okay. the podcast. Right after this. I know you, you, yeah, you like, I'm going to bed an hour ago, right? Because you have to be up at five. I am ready to go to bed. Yeah. So you, you work, you have the radio show that you host in the morning. You have yeah. your podcast in our prime that you do with your husband. And um, you also have a nonprofit. And I wanted to bring this up because this is big for me. Um, you have this nonprofit, the Priscilla e. Frederick Foundation. And the main purpose behind this foundation is to support single moms. So tell single us a little parents. bit about that. Single yes. parents. Yes, yes, single parents. So my mom was a single mother and mm -hmm. I saw everything she went through. We lived in a very small apartment, so she couldn't have those moments to collect herself by herself. And so I saw her break down. I saw her, you know, financially struggle, but she gave us everything we needed. I mean, at Christmas time, it was my sister and I, I always remember this. We opened up, we had to share a present and we got Cinderella on VHS and we were so excited. It was like the best gift ever. Um, our vacations were to the park because my mom would take a day off and I knew that was a huge sacrifice for her but getting ice cream I saw what she did I saw what she went through and so for me I don't want single parents to have to go through that and so I wasn't going to start this nonprofit until I you know made it big but I realized that I can make such a difference right now um, with the collective of people who want to support and so um, I created my board and I'm the CEO and president. My husband is the vice president. And I have this great board uh, group of members who have come from all different walks of life. 
And so some, you know, have, have had it better off. Some are not, some are single, some are married. So it's all different backgrounds. And I just want to do random acts of kindness. What I wanted to do originally was just put paper bags of money on people's steps and be like, here you go, Merry Christmas. But uh, I'm doing it the legal way. And so um, our first our first event is coming up in a few months. Um, and I'm praying I'm not there because I'll be at the games, but my exactly. husband will take it over. And we live in a, in a shore town. And so um, it's going to be like a, it's a bar hop, but it's uh, on bicycles because that's like what we do around here we bike bar to bar and so we're just going to be collecting money talking to random people on the streets and you know getting people to know who we are and I'm really really excited about it I hope to start a scholarship program for children who want to go to a Catholic or a private education um, and the stipulation are they have to do an art they have to do a sport and they have to keep a 3.0 GPA so yes. there's a lot of things that we need I yeah. love it. Yes. And if, and if they don't want to do like, they don't want to play an instrument, then they have to do like coding. They have to do something with like um, technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you are certainly doing a lot. Antigua Federation, get it together. How can you let someone like this be out here in the world and you, you're not capitalizing? I mean, really, I mean, you should be, the Federation should have you on, you know, posters and flyers, you know, Antigua and Barbuda track and feel talking to important delegations, yeah. the whole nine that you can accomplish. I mean, I met you in 2015, I want to say, maybe before the before the games, you were on my most watched YouTube video. <laughs> yes, when I did In Going Rio and I was um, behind the another screen again. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we did others, we did Track Alerts, we did your podcast, yes. we ended up coming back and sharing when um, when I had my social media workshop for my athlete. So just to see your trajectory and everything that you accomplished, I'm really proud of you. And I know, I know for a fact you have so much more in store. Thank yes. you. That's a little I am grateful right now. I am very, very humble and I'm very, very grateful. It's something that I do every day. I write out the things that I'm three things that I'm grateful for that day and uh, you know how I'm gonna make the day amazing. And so it's it's a practice and I realized that you can, you can get swept up in the negative. You truly can. You can get, you can get wrapped up in all the way that things aren't going well, but when you attract it, that's exactly what's going to come your way. And so for me, I really just want to be this representation of like light and love and happiness. And I know it rubs some people the wrong way. Like, oh, she's so fake and she's so annoying, but this is me. I'm not going to allow negativity to, if you don't like it, then you don't have to be with me. You don't got to rub the wrong way. Man, forget them, man. I, don't, I realize that I rub the wrong people the wrong way because I'm so- uh, She's so happy. She's yeah, in like, such oh, a good so mood. Uh, what are you yeah. happy about? Yeah, just stop being so- I, got, like, and, like, look, I'm like, my, my co-host says it all the time in the morning for the radio show. He was like, oh my God, you're always so happy. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like- The world yeah. needs those people. Come on, the world is a place. We need people who are uplifting and happy and giving, bringing that energy. There are people who are going to listen to this and be smiling like, oh man, her energy just makes me feel good. We need those people. I hope all of your listeners know that they are amazing warriors and they are wonderfully made and they can conquer anything if they put their mind to it. And look, if you have haters, look, Cat Williams said it. If you have haters, you're doing something right. Oh. <laughs> if you have haters, you ain't popping. Remember that. Yes. There we go. Yes. There we go. Yes. And I do want to say, Ashley, you know, obviously I've been watching your career as well. I, I truly hope that, you know, you get everything that you deserve. You are a beautiful, beautiful example of hard work, dedication and perseverance. And you're doing the same things just in a different, our GPS destination is the same. We're just taking different routes to it. And so we get in there, we get in there for sure. I wish you nothing but success and happiness. Very nice, very you nice. You know, Adrian, you know, you just coach it. You live a coach. You live in the dream. Please, I don't want to say it. You live, live in the dream. I just want to see right <laughs> him popping. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, hey, hi. <laughs> what's I'm, going on? I'm trying to make this coaching thing look good, man. It's too many old, big belly, you know, wearing cargo shorts. And I'm like, I, we don't, I mean, I'm, you know, they're coaching our 30s. We got to add a little swag and flavor to this thing. And speaking of swag and flavor, where's that watch you got on? I've been oh, oh, there we go. That was such a perfect segue talking about supporting Black businesses. I would like to show you this watch that I got from a former college teammate of mine. Uh, can I? Can I? I'm glad I'm not ashy. Turn it. Turn it. Oh. Turn it. Turn it. 
Turn it. Yes. Yes. Oh. Look at the angles. Look at the glow. Go. Can we see the head face of it? It's quality right there. Yes. Quality. So this is actually really, I'm actually enjoying this and I'm glad he sent it to me. It is, this is called the, the G10 NATO Red, okay? And he has a bunch of different versions of this watch. Support a brother is 4th and Avery on Instagram, 4th and Avery. Um, you should be able to find it there. I believe it's on Facebook as well. I'm in the Facebook store. So this is my first shout out for somebody. If you want some shots, send us some stuff. Uh, <laughs> Ashley needs a watch or something, you know. We need stuff for our host. We get to watch. Everybody gets a watch. Everybody gets a watch. So, well, we actually yeah. have more than three thousand downloads. Uh, yeah, yes, the Around thousands the of people. So, you want to shout out? Send us cool stuff, and we'll rock it for you. Because I'm, I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm gonna wear this out. You know, people like, well, you got that watch? I'm like, fourth and navy, baby. You know. <laughs> and I have a oh, I have a discount code. I actually have a discount yes. code. So, the home stretch podcast is, is starting to pop here. Hold on, what's the discount code? Home stretch. So if you go <laughs> to the site and you type in home stretch, fourth and Avery, 20% off your first order. Ooh. Four and Avery on Instagram. Check out his Facebook store. You use code home stretch to get a home nice stretch. Account. Yes. Quality yeah. watches. Yes. I really it's, all like about, it. it's all about quality contemporary fly fashion oh yes per <laughs> let's get it <laughs> priscilla it was great thank you for joining us thank i'm so going to be so following much. i want to see the rest of your journey this year i want to see you at the olympics for yeah. sure and everything else that you're doing me too oh, yeah. <laughs> see each other at the olympics please tell everyone and all our listeners where we can follow you and what's next yes. for you what's coming up what is coming up? Um, obviously, I mean, my I have the podcast, and so I'm always doing that. I am, you know, still trying to get cleared to train. And so, but it's just a fun journey. I have a lot of things in the works. Um, right now, I'm working with National Geographic. I'm working with some directors and stuff for some really cool work that we're going to do. Um, just showing the journey that I've been on and how exciting and amazing it is. Honey, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> Where can we find you online? Where do people look you, you up? Find me. The best place to do is Instagram. So it's Priscilla underscore Frederick. And I can't change my name because or else I'll lose my blue check. <laughs> yeah. So um, and you guys will know obviously because I'm verified and I'm the chick with the purple hair. So that is my icon. It has the rings on it. Follow me there. And then through there, obviously, you guys can go visit me on PriscillaLumis.com and on my Facebook, Priscilla Loomis. But I am everywhere, so you can't miss me. <laughs> All right. We got to get you back here after the summer. I want to I want to hear some updates. Get you guys on my podcast, so don't yes. worry. Yes. Yes. Switch over, crossover, yeah. collaboration. We got to do a collab. Crossover yeah. event. Yes, I love it. Crossover event. <laughs> oh, I cannot wait for that crossover event. I'm like, I got my popcorn. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so, so Have a good much. one. I appreciate it. Yes. Right, have a great you night. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.